If you would all stand for our reading of the scriptures, today we'll be reading from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. That can be found on page 600 of the Pew Bible. Reading from Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in the body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individual members of one another. This is the word of the Lord. Now, you can get your hymn books and turn to number 440. I'd like you to really pay attention to the words of this song as you stand. Go ahead and stand. Uh, the, the words are a very beautiful um, rendition of the beginning verses of 1 Corinthians 13. I'd like you to see that uh, the tune is familiar. So you can concentrate on the words. Today is Mother's Day. Sunday morning on Mother's Day is always a nice time to be together. Loving on moms, basking in the sweetness. As it turns out, uh, as may be indicated by the songs, uh, our subject is, it's even on love. Uh, yes, it has been for a while now. But love, Mother's Day, you know, it all just goes together. Now, Father's Day is a different sort of day in the sense that it's the day when the importance of the role of fathers is impressed upon us, and then we proceed to tell dads to step it up and be a man. But on Mother's Day, we're very sweet. 
it's possible we have a bit of a Father's Day flair here on Mother's Day. We've seen a bit of that already, if you have your note sheet. In our reading from Ezekiel 33, there in verse 30, it says, As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the wall and in the doors of the houses, and they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, Please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear you. Oh, they hear your words. So, you know, these are, these are just good church people. But they do not do them. They, they hear your words, but they do not do them. So we have good church people, but then when it comes to that they do not do the things they hear, we say that it's like, ah, oh, so we're talking about comfortable church people. For their mouth, with their mouth, they show love. That's an interesting way of saying it. With their mouth, they show. With their mouth, they show love. We might call this orthodoxy. Orthodoxy in the sense of these are stated right beliefs. That's coming down on the right side of things, knowing the right answers. With their mouth, they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. So it, it exposes this chasm between orthodoxy, which is right belief, and orthopraxy, which is right practice, as though the two can truly be divorced because in reality we live out and practice what we really believe. But this describes a situation of conformed beliefs but not displayed in action, the talk without the walk. Verse 33 says, Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song who has a pleasant voice and can play well with an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. There is here a warning against coming to listen and engaging in spiritual pageantry, viewing church, viewing the word of God as an extracurricular activity in the same way that we engage in a spectator sport where we watch and then play the part of the Monday morning quarterback while standing safely on the sidelines throughout, perhaps assessing that can be a positive thing of, well, you know, that boy did all right today. Or it could be assessing and critiquing negatively in terms of, well, you know, I really should have stayed home where I can pick and choose my preacher on YouTube. Or so-and-so wasn't really nice or friendly today. Thinking ourselves the audience rather than the engaged contributing worshipers for they hear your words but they do not do them it's a warning against I'm going to go do church and then come back to my real life and then Ezekiel goes on to say and when this comes to pass surely it will come then they will know that a prophet has been among them. So this is one of those chilling prophetic messages. So we continue to examine the subject of love and grow in our understanding of how God's love is to be the characterizing trait of Christians. And therefore, as a congregation of believers here at Calvary Memorial Church, as we do so, Please allow me to be a teacher and not a prophet. What do I mean by that? Join with me in seeking to understand what God tells us in his word. Let's join together in seeking to live out the truths we find here. 
Allow me to be for us a teacher revealing this truth rather than a prophet proclaiming a message that falls upon polite but deaf ears with fruitless results. So there's my request. Let us pray to God with this goal in mind and ask him for help. Oh God, deliver me from a heart that has a tendency to become hard. Free me from looking at your word with this desire to be affirmed lest I don't hear what I ought to hear and not respond to your word as I ought to respond. May we cling to your word rather than our attitudes the way that we think our, our own understanding. May we hear you afresh this day. Holy Spirit, do a work in my heart, I pray. May this be our desire. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We're here in Romans chapter 12. We are headed, Lord willing, next week toward that famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Now, we're fully capable here of jumping into a passage. We can make some observations. We can glean from it what we will and then move on to the next point. We can do that. But, but I, am, I am burdened to understand and that we would understand the bigger picture, that we would comprehend some of how all of this fits together, how, how these dots connect. We, we, can, we can just sort of pick these passages and like, what can I get out of this? But I want us to look at the big picture. What is, what is this really getting at? Because without such a perspective, we are going to operate with vague conceptions of doing church, vague ideas of what it means to live life as a Christian. A couple of generations ago, rather stereotypically, but when Christianity was more a part of the fabric of, of American thought and life, there was the common trap of, of legalism and moralism. I'm not in any way saying that that's not still a trap today. But with that came the, the tendency to assume that the, that the internal is in order and thus default to focus on externals. We now find ourselves in an era where one, where really each one rather haphazardly defines for themselves what it means to be a Christian. With that comes a tendency to move away from how this has historically been known and understood, that which we might generally describe as established or recognized or orthodox belief. And instead, we can have a tendency to gravitate toward redefining what it means to be a Christian to me. Well, to me, being a Christian... I am a Christian and I believe these things and therefore as a Christian which is to to favor this self-identification this self-definition and then and thus usher in all sorts of unbiblical perspectives though all in the name of being Christian which tragically sees people unknowingly leaving the faith while thinking that they are solid and sound. I don't know if you recognize such trends, but to me, they, they make me want to know, and they make, us, they make me want us to know as believers, as a church, that we are headed in the right direction. I want to know that we are headed in the right direction. I want us to know that we are rightly following our master, not just saying that we are, in the spirit of self-definition that our compass is properly calibrated. 
I want to identify rather than assume the specific aim here at the beginning and then move forward with this understanding because we may otherwise be inclined to be rather indifferent and be content and set instead to just go about doing what we do. I see the Apostle Paul addressing this same thing in his letters. If you think about it, it's a common theme in Scripture to come along and say, this is what you're doing and this is what needs to change. As we, con- as we continue, let us be mindful of what I am likely doing and what needs to change. At the beginning of Romans 12, there's a transition in Paul's letter. You already turned there. Uh, In light of who God is and the attention and devotion he warrants, which is everything. You see that noted in the previous verse, uh, Romans 11, uh, 36, as well as the preceding 11 chapters of this letter as a whole. Having formed this understanding, Paul pleads with the Corinthians to dedicate themselves. Paul pleads with the Corinthians to dedicate themselves. This is a a focused, continual, intentional act to dedicate themselves. For what purpose? To show who God is. This is going to be one of those times where I tell you what I'm going to, what we're going to see, and then we're going to go see it. To dedicate themselves for the purpose to show who God is in order to elevate him, that is to exalt him, lift him high in the eyes and the estimation of others, and thus display what he is like. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. Think about this for a moment. What is it that competes with bringing about that end? That God would be rightly glorified and exalted. Simply put, the exaltation of something else. To exalt something is to lift it high. If, every, if something else is lifted higher, then you have competition. Verse two, verse two addresses the word, uh, or, or addresses uh, the term "the world." Hear this helpful definition from Launida, which is a Greek lexicon or dictionary: the system of practices and standards associated with secular society. That is without reference to any demands or requirements of God. Which is to say, the world's standards independent of or divorced from God. Now, when we hear this stated so clearly, we would, of of course, say, okay, well, that's not okay. But then we would be tempted to think that our intellectual opposition checks the box and concludes the matter. Because, again, we know the right answer, right? But verse 2 is fascinating to me because it gives an instruction That is more accurately a correction. It's a correction seemingly based off a safe presumption. You need to present your body as a living sacrifice acceptable to God in contrast to being conformed to the world. Romans 12.2 is for me a pivotal verse. And I regularly remind myself of this verse Because more than do not be conformed to the world, I need to stop. I need to cease being conformed to the world's patterns, the world's values, motivations, actions, reactions. These are things that I need to put aside by intentionally thinking biblically rather than worldly. And this is hard because... Worldly thinking is much more prevalent. It's much more prevalent, and it is consistently delivered. All the more so because we are accustomed to having everything pitched to us. That's what marketing does. Marketing wants our business. 
and to do so, it appeals to whatever we want. And by default, this makes us, us consumers. And this concept is huge in shaping our perspectives on life, on, on marriage, on family, on the church, and leisure. These are all things that we're used to having people appeal to us. The information and the entertainment we receive, that we consume, that we feed upon, that makes for a huge influence in our day because we have these devices in our pockets and we are a very device-directed people. And so this influence of the world is pervasive and worldly thinking is far more prevalent and we're the customers. The way we communicate, the nature of the things we discuss, the movies we watch, the perspectives communicated through the news. If you go and Google something, the first or most popular search results are what we generally receive as the answer and truth. Don't we? Worldly thinking is much more prevalent. Worldly thinking is going to be the natural inclination. Left to myself, it is normal. It fits comfortably with the way that I think. And I need the word of God to tell me to stop, to identify this. Because that which is most prevalent and most natural is going to need to be resisted continually at the most foundational level, at the level of the way that we think. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The idea behind the word conform is to be molded. It is to be molded to a pattern or a set of standards. The idea behind transformation, transformation is a Greek word, metamorpho, which is the obvious, has the obvious tie to the English word metamorphosis, which speaks of an essential change of nature. That's, that's not mere conformity, it's a change of nature. Now this is a, a noteworthy distinction to consider. And again, dear people, I know that we know the answer. I know that we know the answer. We know that we're not to be conformed, but transformed. We know that we need to receive this teaching. Please let us receive this teaching because it's, it's sort of like you've been around people who are on a diet. And, and it's one of those things that when that, f that comfort food comes up, oh, oh. Conformity is our comfort food. It's the thing that is calling to us, calling us away at every turn. Think about this. What is our motivation behind what we do? Why do we do what we do? Because someone else did it? Someone else is doing it? We're following the example of another person and we're trying to get the same desired outcome. Well, you know, you, you should listen to this person. This person wrote a book. They're well known. They're popular. They're successful. They have a, a, a bigger gig. They have more money. They have a bigger platform. Look at what they're doing in their church. Let's grab some of their secret sauce and get those results. But let me ask us, honestly, is that being conformed or transformed? Conformed 
to American church culture where I just seek to not be unlike somebody else, everyone else? Or is that transformed by the word of God as we feed upon that which the Holy Spirit uses to do his work in us? This is a question I ask myself as I, as I look at why we do what we do. And this is the question. How many steps removed are we from just doing what the Bible says? Back in the days of Christian bookstores before everything was online, the scene was very telling. You have, you have this section here for Bible study, and then you have this section here for inspirational writing. Perhaps being more interested in Christian commentators than the Bible itself. This idea of confirmation versus transformation. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Verse 1, because it's reasonable and it's appropriate to be a holy, set-apart, living sacrifice, acceptable to God, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, that we may show him off, not the world, not even American evangelicalism, but that we would show him off, that we might display what he is like, not mirror what the word is like, the world is like, because that is going to be our tendency. Worldly examples are all but unanimous. But as believers in Jesus Christ, we are not to be unanimous with the world, but anomalous. That means deviating from and inconsistent with the norm. As you progress through Romans 12, it's interesting to note there in verse 3, there's this call away from pride to humility which is something we've been talking about for a while, which establishes the foundation for proper function in the, the diverse body of Christ with each person different than the other and the need to value and intentionally care for each one. If those verses aren't difficult enough to stomach, keep reading. When you get to verse four, it's 14, it's sure to usher in the, uh, uh, yeah, but bless those who persecute you. What? That's not the way it works. Do not be wise in your own opinions. Yeah, but, but there, repay no evil for evil. Wait, wait, but what about verse 18? If it is possible, oh, huh, 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 huh. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I doubt they will, as much as depends upon you, Don't worry about them and what you can't control. As much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. That covers a broader span than we are comfortable. We can firmly and confidently correct a child who retaliates and hits another kid, but excuse ourselves for the same outbursts of selfishness, though in the realm of what is socially acceptable. Verse 19 says, do not avenge yourselves. Let God take care of that. Oh, yeah, but what if he doesn't? If your enemy is hungry, verse 20, feed him. If he is thirsty, or if he is thirsty give him a drink. Seriously? That's not normal do not overcome uh, do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good that's what that's not normal that it doesn't work that way that's that's not the way it's done that's the point that, that's the point the rub comes in how different it is to operate from the norm the norm being that which is understandable and natural 
and therefore what is expected. We are to display who God is. To show what he is like, how different and holy he is by displaying how he has made us different and set us apart for himself. We are to love not like the world, but like God. There are innumerable examples of operating like the world. That's the majority. We see this played out here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. This is here at the beginning of the Apostle Paul's letters to the Corinthians. And he addresses the letter to whom? To the church of God. First and foremost, this is who they are. This is how they are identified and known. They are not defined by their job, whether they're a statesman or whether they're a slave, not even whether they're a mother or a father, but the church of God, the called out ones, saved by God from the fate of hell, together a people of God for God, and how that takes place is then described, those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, Sanctified is to be set apart. It distinguishes us as belonging to and changed by God. The purchased possession of Jesus Christ. Called to be saints. Those in Christ, that's what you are called. That is your name. It is who you are. It is how you are known. In our day of self-identifying, there is a greater call upon your life than what you think or feel about yourself. But what God says, and here Paul addresses those belonging to God and a part of Christ's body, to, uh, to the church of God, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. This is talking about the universal church. Jesus Christ is the door and there is no other way in apart from acceptance of and faith in him. This is the statement that makes believers one. One confession in the Lord. As soon as we move away from this foundational understanding and highlight other things, conflict is going to reign. As soon as we move away from our profession of with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, as soon as we move away from that, <coughs> as soon as we move away from that, we are going to engage in conflict. I imagine that there used to be in the city one church. There was one church where people were known as those who trusted in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And then there was a building. And then someone said, oh, you know what we should do is we should put carpet in there. Hey, that's a good idea. What color? A couple weeks later, there was the second Baptist church on the corner of what's it and who's it? Why? Because, because we turned our eyes off of the one thing and conflict took over. This is a confession of who they are and who they are together. This is Paul's Lord. This is Sosthenes' Lord. This is the Lord of the church of God which is at Corinth. You've heard the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We can talk about these things because the Wingates aren't here anymore and that's where uh, Sydney was from. And so we, so now it's time to, you know you've been holding back all of the things you've had to say about Vegas. But what sort of implication does that carry? What sort of implication does that carry? What 
happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Positive, negative? Pretty negative. It implies that Vegas is a place where you go and do that which you ought not. And this saying is a pact of sorts to keep such activities a secret as though there can be a place that is set aside for wickedness where you can go engage in wickedness, emerge unscathed, protected by the claimed freedom that wipes the slate clean by reciting the phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Corinth was a place of learning, lust, and luxury. And Paul is writing to the church of God at Corinth. In Revelation chapter 2, the king, Lord Jesus, addressed the church in Pergamos, stating, I know your works and where you dwell where Satan's throne is. The Lord knows where they were. He, he, he knew what they were doing and he knew where they were. The Lord Jesus knows where we are. He knows what we are doing. And he deemed them to be a compromising church. <clears throat> if we went with the lingo of our day, we would say they were very tolerant. They were a compromising church. And as a consequence, they had, litter, they had very little to offer the city of Pergamos. The church itself was becoming indistinguishable from the world around them, operating just like everybody else, exalting not the Lord Jesus, exalting the world. <clears throat> the church of Corinth had multitudinous problems because they were not distinct from the carnal, unredeemed Corinthian culture around them. They needed to be told to stop. They needed to re be reminded of who they are. They needed to be told to repent of their sinful ways and to reflect the one they claimed. Do you see the tie from what we're learning in Romans chapter 12? They were the church of God in Corinth, and Corinth needed them to be that. Corinth needed them to be the church of God in their midst. Corinth was ignorant of and likely antagonistic toward God. And Corinth needed the church in Corinth to not be like them, but to be different and to introduce them to the God who can effect such a transformation. But that wasn't happening because the church was being conformed to the culture, not transformed as the changed people of God. As a result, the church did not have anything to offer the unbelieving city. Their conduct showed little distinction, and at least by observation, they had no living gospel to export. They needed to, the city needed them to fulfill their duty as God's people in the place where they were and not be selfishly indulging themselves and denying the claim that God has on their life. They needed to be the church of God, which is at Corinth, as we need to be the church of God that is in Racine. There's a duty that we have to this place because this is where God has placed us as the church of God in this place. So Paul is writing to address a mess in the church of God. As we progress in the letter and come to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, we will see what it looks like when the church ignores the instruction of Romans chapter 12, as well as how to fix it. 
there were major problems. If you come to verse 11, there were major problems surrounding the Lord's Supper. Each month, as I read from 1 Corinthians 11, when we come together for communion, we need to keep this background in mind that Paul was writing to address a mess in the church. And we need to remember that so that I will be warned, so that I will be sobered. Because these are not things that like, oh yeah, those Corinthians were all wet, but me, I'm all good. The reality is, as chapter 11 reveals, they were not being unified. They were being selfish. Sure, they called it a love feast, but the love was lacking. They were not functioning as a cohesive body, but they were competing with and devaluing others in the church, even to the point of warring over spiritual gift, uh, spiritual gifts and who was best, whose gifts were best. In chapter 12, Paul refers to the church as a body, as a body. It's quite a word picture. How is, how is this body functioning? Some parts weren't doing anything. Others were fighting. We look at that and we say, oh, that, that's absurd. But imagine this, where you have this, this, this one's doing whatever it wants. This one here is causing problems for things over here. Hey, y'all, y- y'all need to trust in Jesus and come over here because he changes people. And Paul's addressing this, this church and he's like, you are, you are to be the church of God in Corinth. The church of God. That's who you are. And this is where I have you. And you need to display what I am like. We have this lovely orchestra here. How well would this work? <clears throat> Let's see here. We have one, two. Okay, so here's seven seats here. And there's a piano and organ. What if each one of our instrumentalists when it's time to start singing, that each one of them tries to play louder and faster than the other one to get to the end. So they can get to the end and be like, ha, everyone heard me more than you, and I got done first. How well would that work? It wouldn't. But they said they were playing together. Yeah, but what needs to that needs to be an observation, not a mere declaration. Paul pleads with the church to dedicate themselves to being the church, to show who he is, to elevate him in the eyes of others and to display what he is like. A lost world needs to see that there is something here. Needs to see that there is something here that they don't see anywhere else. They don't need more of the world. They need to see the love of God displayed. And Paul continues to address what amounts to a love problem in the church as we come to, um, should the Lord tarry, um, Lord willing, next week we will be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But before we just jump in to a familiar passage and say, yep, 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 need to be aware of the fact that these are, these are things that it's addressing a problem. 
and I need to allow the word of God to be for me a mirror that I look in and say, okay, God, you're writing to your people to address problems pointed out to me so that I can write what is wrong in order to show him off rather than doing my own thing and thus exalt the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you talk in a way that we can understand. I pray that that was accomplished this morning in some small part. But I pray that we would not fall into the trap of sort of looking at things and and kind of focusing in on the gray area of, oh, well, what, what, is, what does this say? Or, or what about this? Or I wonder about the nuance of this. But that we would just look at what you're clearly saying and concern ourselves first with just doing what you say and then worrying about little things later but not letting those little things divert us from who we are and our confession of faith in Jesus Christ. For the sake of your name we pray, amen. Our hymn of response is turn to number 486, Jesus Calls Us or the tumult. Um, if, you have, uh, if you would like to come and pray with someone, we would be happy to pray with you after the service, uh, of men and women who will be here to pray if as you need that. Let's stand and sing, number 486. Benediction is from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Heavenly Father, may we exalt you. As a church, may we exalt you as your people as we go back to what we do the rest of the, the time we're not here. May we operate as your people, drawing attention to who you are. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of 